what does dispositions mean? What is what is behind a dispo don name, man? <laughs> the dispo don, right? Uh, so dispositions is basically, you know, for those who are are new to the business or new to real estate and wholesaling in general, we we can break it down into, into a couple parts, right? You have the act of actually getting a seller or a property um, as what we call a lead or a prospective lead. You know, somebody that's interested in selling, they have some type of motivation, you know, they have some type of issue that you're trying to solve um, and you're generating them as a lead because you want your team to figure out, hey, how can we negotiate with this person to get them under contract, get a deal going that we can help them, right? So that's the lead gen portion of it. Then goes to the acquisition portion of the business where it's you're basically negotiating numbers with the seller. You're, you're figuring out the best solution to their problem of how you can actually use your skills in investing to help them you know, either sell their property um, or rent it out or whatever the exit is. Um, and then you have disposition or dispo, which is what I do, which is essentially getting the deal closed and sold, right? So if we get a property under contract from a seller who's looking to sell the property, whether we're keeping it ourselves or, you know, selling it to another end buyer or somebody that's going to live in the property, the process of physically taking that from a contract to cash in our hands or a closed deal is what this position is. Okay, welcome to another episode of Affordable Housing and Real Estate Investing. Today, we got my guy, Emeka, the Dispo Don. And <laughs> I'm so excited to bring this guy on for all of our listeners today because when I first had the, my first conversation with Emeka at the Sub2 Mastermind, I was like, this is going to be a friend for a very, very long time. And I was so happy having such like a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with this guy. <laughs> but Ameka is an entrepreneur. He's based out of Washington, D.C. area. He originally started a small wholesale operation with his partner, Olu, uh, another sub two member who was a great, great closer. But he has grown their business nationwide, focused on acquisitions, buy and holds, and creative financing. And you're going to find out why he's called the Dispo Don because he specializes in property disposition for direct to seller and referral leads across multiple, multiple markets. So if you're an investor that needs help closing your first deal, you got to reach out to Ameka and Olu. They are your guys for sure. So, Ameka, welcome to the show, man. Yo, How are you doing today? Woo, 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 woo. Hey, what's going on, Cat man? How are you doing? I'm fantastic, man. I'm I'm just so excited you made the time on on this weekend morning. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Showing up for our listeners. I, I'm so appreciative of it, man. And like I said in the beginning, I was so impressed by you and your story. And I think it would be amiss if we didn't start with like learning a little bit about your family and your family's background. So maybe let's start there. Just tell us a little bit about your family, your your relationship with affordable housing, mm -hmm. and how you got into real estate investing, man. Absolutely, absolutely. First off, let me just start out by giving some flowers to Kent because he's he's not, I don't think, you know, giving himself enough credit for how much he's actually done and how much of a great guy he is and getting us all on here to, to connect with you guys and give you some info. The first time I met him not too long ago, um, it was an automatic, automatic hit. You know, I already knew that we we're going to do some great things, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on here. Um, but yeah, man, I am. Uh, I like he said, um, I am a serial investor myself. You know, started out just like most people who do in, in the market, just trying to learn their way through and fail forward. Um, and uh, it brought me here today. So initially, um, I'll get into a little bit of the background about myself. Uh, like you said, I'm from the DMV area. Uh, for those who don't know, it's D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Um, and, you know, when we first started having our conversation about affordable housing and like the, uh, the type of opportunities that, you know, we can offer for people in the future and you know what we can develop, that's where we really hit it off. Um, and it, it is close to my heart just because um, coming from, you know, a first generation, you know, immigrant family that came to this country that, you know, worked their way up to where we are now, just being able to be comfortable and, you know, have careers and, um, you know, different investments and stuff like that, you know, affordable housing and being in those communities is something that's very important. It's very important because a lot of times people have, they don't have the resources when they first come here. 
Um, and that's that's kind of how you know I started myself. So um, I come from a pretty big family. Um, I got three brothers and sisters. Um, they're all older than me. I'm the baby. You know, this, the most savvy one, also of course, uh, <laughs> of the of the fam. But um, yeah, both of my parents came here from Nigeria. Um, very very hard hardworking people. Um, you know, came here with, with a language barrier with you know, the knowledge that they wanted to create a better life for themselves and their family. Um, and, you know, my dad initially came to this country working multiple jobs, you know, while he was trying to get his pharmacy degree and, you know, working as um, a taxi driver and, you know, chauffeuring people around the city while my mom was working at McDonald's and doing all these other type of jobs while she was going to nursing school. And so, of course, in that time, you know, money's tight money's tight. So we're, we're living in um, inner city communities that are, you know, huge for, you know, these affordable housing areas. Um, and you're not really knowledgeable about what type of options you have, because you're really just trying to make it and just trying to like, fit in with everybody else. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the best thing that you can do is just try to continue to work hard and you know, get more money from other jobs to try to move in different areas. Um, and my older siblings probably had the most exposure, you know, to that environment, um, especially just because, I, you know, they were the ones that were kind of raising me and, you know, taking care of me while my parents were, were at work. Um, and one thing that has always been really a driver for my real estate, I would say, experience, real estate business, you know, all, just something that it's inspired me in this lane has always been to be, how can I go back and create similar opportunities that I've had in my life for people that are in those environments or just shake the system up a little bit, right? You know, make it more um, accessible for people that actually need the help. Um, and also, you know, what can we do about making sure that we, they have the highest quality of a living experience that you know for whether you want to say systematic reasons or colloquial reasons in a lot of these communities they don't have um you know i come from an area where it's you know the part of the dmv area that i'm from it's very multicultural um very mixed with a lot of different people who are you know range from making a lot of money to people who are below way well below the poverty line um all living in the same communities but not in the same living conditions, right? And so, um, you know, for me going to school and, you know, being with a lot of kids that were in the same living condition that I was in, um, and then even people who were a lot much worse, um, and really understand like, wow, like there's a lot of things that are, they can't control that they're still subject to. Um, and we need to find a way to, to change basically. Um, and Mecca, I, I love that. And I'll, let me understand a little bit more about where did you grow up? And was it, you were, you grew up in affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure like I said that clearly. And like, were you guys in a single family home in apartment buildings? Like what, what kind of conditions did you guys live in? And then mm -hmm. also like, what does your neighborhood look like? What, what was that? Right. So like? um, definitely. So started off in, in what well, was like, a one bedroom apartment, you know, with, with four people. Right. Um, and then from there, you know, started moving to different apartment complexes until we had saved enough money to buy our first home outside the city. And in those neighborhoods, it's in those, those living conditions, it's not, you know, you have people who are really just trying to make it. Um, and, you know, you're living in areas where on the outside, Let's say I'll give a perfect example. Montgomery County is one of the richest counties in the country, also in the Maryland region, right? Um, and you'll have areas where they have all the nice shopping stores and centers, whatever, nice houses. And then you'll also have the places where the affordable housing is, right? The people, the apartment complexes, everybody's kind of mixed together in the same area. Um, and it's just like, it's crazy because you're so much in close proximity to people that are living in better conditions than you, but the experience is so drastically different, 
right? Because you're living in an air, you're living in an apartment complex, whether it's a high rise, where you know there's not a lot of attention to the community. You know, your people who are, um, you know, struggling to make make payments, people who are you know struggling in between jobs. I had a lot of friends that were growing up in in households where, at a very young age, they were forced to become you know, leaders in the household to develop their own income and, and bring that back home. Um, luckily for me, you know, I grew up with older siblings and, and and parents who were constantly working two or three jobs at a time, you know, to support us. And so it's it's basically like you, you in those type of environments, you find beauty in the little things and the fact that you're you're living in a close knit family and and that you're together, but you're still kind of distract yourself around away from what you're actually living in, right? Like what the actual scenario is, what your actual living conditions are. Um, and it took a while for for us to, to basically work our way up to a point where we were in a single family home, a little bit outside of those you know, high rise apartments uh, where we can afford those payments. And not everybody's as lucky. Um, I, I can distinctly remember back to in elementary school when, you know, I'd be, we had just moved out to the house, you know, gotten that good house. Um, and I'd be going to school with people who were in, in similar communities that we came from. And you're looking at them still have the same experiences that you have, but now you're in a new, in a new area. And it's, it's almost one of those things like it, it almost not say it tears you up inside, but you know, you kind of feel about like, why is this the status quo? Like, what, like, why is this a thing? Like, you know, why doesn't everybody have that same opportunity? Um, and a lot of it is because there's not, you know, nobody really knows a lot of the um, the tools that are accessible to them. It's kind of like once you're in that community and like you're trying to do your best to get out of it, you know, you don't have a lot of attention, you don't have a lot of help. And so a lot of the same systematic things that you would be subject to just continue to repeat themselves, especially for people who are from a younger generation um, when they grow up in, you know, affordable housing, maybe it's in, in a project outside of DC or, you know, some place in, in PG County, they're subject to what they see on a daily basis, which is not the best housing conditions, you know, maybe apartment complexes where the, you know, the landlords and, you know, although they have government assistance for people helping them pay, there's not a lot of attention to the needs of the building, to the needs of the people. Um, a lot of people, you know, kind of feel like they're forgotten in those communities and left to fend for themselves. Oh, yeah. And the biggest thing for me is just that how can we look at that head on, understand where we are on that in the system, and then at least raise awareness for letting people understand the options that they have, and then also trying to shake the system up a little bit. And, and Emeka, I think that is so, so important because I, I hear about your story and what a grind it was for for your family, like going through the motions, but then also dealing with the environmental challenges that you have for your family because you guys are trying to get out. But how do you know how to get out when someone never showed you the way or someone never showed you what else is possible in, in this environment? Right. And I think that's going to be really, really good to kind of keep in mind for our listeners. Like one of the reasons we started this podcast was to bring people who lived in affordable housing because we need a different perspective, not just from the investor side, but from people that you grew up uh, in affordable housing like you and myself so that we can share these experiences and actually help people understand why it's so hard to get out of this environment because there are systematic challenges. <laughs> the, the opportunities just aren't there. So maybe let's transition to like, knowing the background that you kind of came from, how did you make that transition to real estate investing? Like what, what made you decide like, Hey, I need to get into real and real estate investing. Honestly, what made me just decide to get into real estate investing was I wanted the ability to have housing for everyone in my family. If somebody needed it. Not only people, my I, I come from like a background where a lot of my close friends I consider family, but just because we grew up so close together, um, and so you know they would be included in that statement also. <clears throat> and the main reason why is because I want to be I wanted to be able to be at a point where, 
you know, knowing how money was always tight growing up and, and the type of struggles that we went through, I never wanted a point where in the future where I'm, I have my family, I have my kids and, you know, we're, we're living the life that we want to, that I had a loved one who was struggling to make ends meet to find a quality place to live. That was really the first thing that kind of came to my interest in real estate investment. Um, on top of that, it was how can we, you know, how can I make some passive income from some, from, you know, a quality investment that I can control? And that was another, another thing that was really big for me because I've always been good with money. I've always been good with, with managing things. Um, I just wanted something that I could make my own and really be a driver, you know, for this new wave of people that are creating opportunities not only for kids that look like me, but people who understand how difficult it is in some situations to make it out of and are willing to go back and like lend a hand for others behind them. Like I think, it's, it, you know, it's really important for me to, to get to a point where I can take all the knowledge that I have and or I have attained and be able to give that back to other kids in the, in the communities that I came from. Um, and let them know, like, hey, like, you can do this even now, you know, at, in high school or whenever the case may be. Start building something that you could call your own, that you can make money off of, that you could, you know, help your family out with. Um, and that was really the biggest thing. Like, I, when I got, to, I, I, didn't, I got, I think, interested in real estate when I was really in college, and I was paying rent for all, you know, all these apartment complexes I was living in. And I was like, hey, man, this sucks. Like, I need a house. <laughs> I need something for myself. Like, I travel, you know, I went to school in Cleveland um, for uh, for my college degree. I was playing sports out there, doing a lot of stuff. Um, and it was, you know, it was really far from family. Um, and I just had this idea, like, man, like, I really wish I had a house in, in a lot of these areas where I could just go and stay and have family come over or it was, it's not an issue to have a place for anybody. Um, dude, dude, I love I love that spark you had, man, because that's really, really interesting because no, most people would have just paid the rent and said whatever, like they will complain about the rents, but you thought one step ahead already. You said, how do I become the owner of these properties? So maybe let's talk about this. Like either what mistakes did you make when you first got started in real estate investing? Because I think that's going to be a really, really important lesson to learn. Or just tell us about your first deal because people get scared of starting because they fear the unknown but if we're able to learn from you about what mistakes you have made in the beginning of your career that helps demystify the process for our listeners today and say okay i want to get started i don't really know what might happen but this might happen but at least i, le I learned from Emeka, and Emeka has done this or learned from this lesson uh, in his career so tell us a little bit about your first deal or just some of the mistakes that you actually made in the beginning of your career so let me just go out and say this first. I've probably made almost every mistake in the book as far as, <laughs> as, far as real estate investing. Like I am, for the people listening, I am by no means a guru or whatever at any of this stuff. I'm just a guy just like everybody else who has an idea and, you know, who just wants to make something out of it. Um, and, I, and, and, I, and I, the reason why I say that is because I feel like there's a misconception about entrepreneurs and people who start investing that you really have to be this person that's super, super driven, that has everything planned out. That's like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. That's always motivated. It's always, you know, you see all these motivational speakers and people who are making millions of dollars, Ed Milet, the Grant Cardone. It's like, oh, I have to be exactly like that guy. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that, um, you know, internally for me when i first started out was that i had to have it all figured out that i had to be this super outgoing and like driven all type of you know hardcore personalities whatever type of person in order to make it in the business and in the reality it's really just having an idea doing a little bit of research and connecting with people locally like that are in your market or um, who are doing something similar and then just getting started. Like for anybody that's watching this, the biggest, if you want to get started in real estate, the biggest advice I could give you or tell you is think about your reason why you want to do it. Um, think about what 
realistically you would want your investment to look like like your your experience in the business to look like would you want to be like oh a landlord with a lot of properties do you envision yourself being you know somebody like a grant cardone who's doing all types of businesses and training people or whatever try to have somewhat of an idea of what that looks like um even if it's not fully thought out and then just start going and connecting with people and taking action and when i say that i mean as simple as hey i'm on facebook i'm interested in real estate let me join a real estate investment group in my local area and say hey i'm looking for people who are doing this this is what i'm thinking about is that who who can i connect with and then in that time you know you can start doing a little bit of research here and there about what you know what type of business you want to have or what type of investments you want to do and literally as soon as you start doing research start doing it just start doing whatever you see that you you feel comfortable with and you know whoever you've been able to connect with and in your market and, and been able to talk to take that advice and then hit the ground running just start doing it because you learn most in this business by failing and using your failures to drive the direction where you want to go. When I first started, um, you know, I just got out. Of, I was in college, just finishing. Um, my partner and I, Olu, you know, we were looking at, you know, different areas of like markets where we wanted to start. And like, we we're kind of like tiptoeing into real estate rather than just diving in. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes. It's just like, if you're going to do it, just do it. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, I'm by no means the most like, action oriented person or like super driven like you have to you know understand who you are and then just push yourself a little bit like make yourself on you know, make yourself comfortable with the uncomfortable basically um and um i think you know one of the biggest mistakes i did initially was just like tiptoeing into it too slow and then thinking that i had to have it all figured out and doing it by myself because i'm really somebody that you know, I'm a very resourceful guy. Um, you know, I'm a technical by trade, you know, so I always want to figure out how I can make this perfect or do this by myself and, and do it to a complete standpoint where I can, you know, take responsibility for everything. Um, and then this is not the business for that. Like, if you think about the people who are the most successful, the billionaires in real estate, majority of them don't even use their own money majority of them don't even do the day-to-day -day, actually none of them do the day-to-day -day of what's making them money they typically you know are just disciplined in taking action and then learning from that action and systemizing it and making it better um dude yeah. i love i love that your first advice was actually mindset related because people exactly like you said think they have to know every single thing in the world just to get started they need to have all the money in the world and that's not true it's like get educated start researching it's like i told you this story my first deal was a short-term rental but i was so scared that i just did so much research so much research but still i got myself educated i listened to podcasts and i learned how to analyze deals and then i just made sure i analyzed at least a deal every single day while i was doing my full-time job that's really all you need to do you just need to start analyzing deals because you need to get over your hump and prove to yourself that you know what you're doing instead of being scared so what i advise my friends to do nowadays like dude Analyze the deal every day, but track how many deals you analyze so that when it comes time for you to buy a property, you can look back at your results and be like, oh, look, I've analyzed 50 deals already. So I think I do know sort of what I'm doing. And I think you got to prove to yourself that you know what you're doing so that you can get over that fear and actually get started. So it's so, so much mindset related. And I love that you brought that up, man. I really, really do. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's, it's mindset. And then, like you said, just getting over the hump, like just not thinking everything has to be fully thought out before you take the action from it. The way we started, um, we probably even started the hardest route by just trying to go tiptoe into wholesaling. Like there's no tiptoeing into wholesaling. Like you either do it or you don't. And so I started out, you know, joining all these Facebook groups in, in the Maryland area and then started out cold calling sellers. And even in that, like, you know, I'm a pretty good person conversationally, but sometimes you're scared to hop on the phone. You know, you're scared to hop on the phone and make a call to somebody or talk to somebody about a property. And 
you need to give yourself the space to fail with whatever you're starting out with, whether it's, you know, analyzing properties and, and like you're looking at something that you want to purchase yourself or you have some cash that you want to go in on a rental property or you have no money, but you have time. So you want to invest your time into learning and calling people like go do it, give yourself the space to fail and then whatever failure you get, look at it as an opportunity to grow and learn from it. Um, because for me, you know, when I first started out wholesaling, I was cold calling, you know, sellers and cold calling buyers and, you know, talking to people in the market. I was sometimes getting butterflies in my stomach to, to even hop on the phone. And then I would just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll push it off till tomorrow. I'll, I'll do this. And I'll, and, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't help anything. You know, you just got to go through it and do it. And then um, just do it to the max. Like if you're doing, if you want to go the wholesale route like we did, and if you have the time to do it, call, you know, sit on the dollar and just keep on calling, call hundreds of people a day. And I think for our first deal, um, which took a while, took a while, like a couple months to get our first deal, because we thought that by calling five, 10 people a day, that we were actually going to make a dent into any market, which is ridiculous if you think about it because people that are making money doing wholesale deals they're calling you know they have virtual assistants or, or people on their team that are calling two thousand dials a day two thousand phone numbers and when we're starting off it was me and my partner you know after work calling for like an hour and a half talking to five ten people and thinking that we were going to get something done and then and then once we start looking at the numbers it's just like oh wow yeah that's why nothing came in because we're not doing anything, <laughs> you know, we need to, we need to amp that. And so if, if you, if somebody wants to start that route, I would say maximize your output, maximize your action and your output, reach out to as many people in the market as you can to try to collaborate with them, get advice from them, maybe even work with them to help them start making calls to them. Um, even if that means, you know, sacrificing, you know, money in as far as your first deal or splitting it it's way it's i would say that it's much easier to do it that way than by doing it yourself and Emeka, I, I need to make sure i highlight this for people because you just shared a number that is freaking ridiculous because you said two thousand calls people underestimate how much work it actually takes to be successful as a wholesaling operation that five to 10 calls, that's what I used to do. I used to call five to 10. And I was like, okay, I made like five calls today. Like I did some work, blah, blah, blah. But that's why I realized like, I can't just be focused on that. That's why I found you and teamed up with you. One, to figure out who else is doing this in the space that's more successful than me and learn from them what they're doing. But then also trying to figure out how to provide value to someone like Kameka and Olu so that we can actually squat up on a deal and actually, you know, the power is in the numbers here. So Maybe let's transition the conversation so that the guests can understand, like, what is it that you do in your business right now, Mecca? Like, what does dispositions mean? What is what is behind a Dispo Don name, man? <laughs> the Dispo Don, right? Um, so dispositions is basically, you know, for those who are, are new to the business or new to real estate and wholesaling in general, we, we can break it down into, into a couple parts, right? You have the act of actually getting a seller or a property um, as what we call a lead or a prospective lead. You know, somebody that's interested in selling, they have some type of motivation, you know, they have some type of issue that you're trying to solve um, and you're generating them as a lead because you want your team to figure out, hey, how can we negotiate with this person to get them under contract, get a deal going that we can help them, right? So that's the lead gen portion of it. Then goes to the acquisition portion of the business where it's you're basically negotiating numbers with the seller. You're, you're figuring out the best solution to their problem of how you can actually use your skills in investing to help them you know, either sell their property um, or rent it out or whatever the exit is. Um, and then you have disposition or dispo, which is what I do, which is essentially getting the deal closed and sold, right? So if we get a property under contract from a seller who's looking to sell the property, whether we're keeping it ourselves or, you know, selling it to another end buyer or somebody that's going to live in the property, 
the process of physically taking that from a contract to cash in our hands or a closed deal is what disposition is. So I need to emphasize this for, for our listeners here. You are being paid to basically find a buyer. So for all the people out there that knows the phrase, your net worth is, or your network is your net worth. This is a perfect example of that. Emeka just has a list of all the buyers and he knows exactly what prices they need to buy so they can be profitable. That is so important because guess what? The number one fear when people lock up deals is like, oh my God, I hope the buyer closes or I hope the buyer would definitely buy it. You need to know what the criteria is for these buyers so that you know that if you lock up a deal that's at a good price, you're going to find a buyer and make that wholesale fee. But that's not the case. Sometimes when you buy a property, like if you buy a $2 million home, then you're going to Airbnb it. Chances of you cash flowing is actually very low because of how high the purchase price is. The same goes for some of these wholesale deals that Emeka is doing that they're locking up and that they have the buyers that who might be fixing flippers, who might be investors themselves, but he has all this criteria. So maybe let's talk about Emeka. How did you even like meet all these buyers how did you find them and what kind of conversations do you have with them do you always have a conversation like hey i found you on the mos seems like you just did a flip what else are you buying what's your criteria like what how does that conversation go how does a newbie actually go about becoming a dispositions person that's a great question um so the first thing i will say is that in doing dispo right it's like in my opinion I think it's 10 times easier than talking to sellers because you are talking to people who are always going to be motivated for some, you know, for whether to buy a house, buy a property, you know, get something for a rental, for a tenant, whatever the case may be. You don't have to go through the process of trying to figure it out if they want to do something. You are literally talking to somebody who their end goal is to find more people like you so they can do more deals for themselves. That in itself had had me sold, right? Like <laughs> that in itself was like, oh, okay, cool. So I'm talking to people that actually want to talk to me. Awesome. That's what I like to do, anyways. So um, for me, I think that you know when you start getting involved in dispo, like you really just have to not be afraid to talk to people in your market and see what they're doing, what they're looking for. So for example, you got you, somebody's doing their first deal. They, they, they go through all the hoops and, 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 and hoopla to get a deal in a contract. You know, they consulted some people about the numbers and the numbers look pretty good. They know their market. They're like, you know what? I can, I can do something with this. They got their first contract, right? They're ready to go. And they say, all right, cool. Now what happens now? Or right, well, the deal is done, right? Like, no, you gotta, if you're wholesaling, you gotta figure out who to sell that to, right? You gotta figure out who's going to, who's going to take that. So now you're thinking, oh crap, like I only have 30 days to, you know, to get rid of this property, what am I going to do? Um, the first thing and the easiest way to start getting in, into dispositions, building that dispo acumen and that team and everything, go and look at the these recently sold properties in your area for that property you have on the contract. And for those, you know, if you're already gotten your deal on the contract, you would have already looked at the numbers in that neighborhood. You've already looked at you know, what things are selling for. So you should have an idea of what amount of money you're looking to get on top of what you have it under contract for or what you want to sell it for. And once you have that figured out, literally call the agent of every property in that neighborhood that has sold or even is listed and just be like, hey, you guys look like you do deals. I want to do deals with you. What do you think about this? That's literally how I, that is literally how I started my first disco conversation. Honestly, I found somebody on Facebook that was um, an agent that had a, a property listed in, in the neighborhood that we had our property under contract for. And um, I literally called them up and said, Hey, like, I don't really, I'm kind of new to this market. I don't really have a lot of deals done or have really done much of anything, but I know that you are doing de deals. I can see that, you know, I see the listings. So, if you have a buyer or if you know anybody, you know, you don't even have to say if you have a buyer, if you know anybody that's looking for more properties like these, would you be willing to take a look at this? And I, you know, and you send them the information and honestly, like that is free because typically 
when you go on Zillow or any of these agent websites, their information is going to be there. You don't have to go figure them out. You can literally call them right up. Um, you know, you'll be able to see what other properties they've sold or what other work they've done in the area. And literally, you can find all of that in five minutes. Give them a call off your regular. You don't have to pick up your regular phone. Hey, one, two, three, four. Mr. Ken, I saw you, you sell a property last week. Do you are you have anybody that's looking for more? And you just made your first dispo call. As simple as that. You know, and all yeah. that took only five minutes, guys. Five minutes. Five minutes. And then and anybody and, can do this. Anybody, anybody can do this. Can do this. Rebecca, you don't have a superpower I don't know about, right? You just you, you're just a regular guy window shopping on Zillow. That's it. I'm a regular guy. <laughs> this, is, this is my my regular guy on here. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's a regular <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no, listen, like it's it's that easy because you gotta think about it. Like people in this market, you know. Whatever market you're in, there's always going to be people looking for deals, always going to be people, you know, trying to buy more properties that they already have. Right. So what better way to sell a deal than to go for the people that are already doing what you're trying to do? Right. Go find them. And the easiest way to find them is through, you know, find an agent who has a sold property, you know, or who's doing stuff in that area. Ask them if they have, you know, anybody that they're working with that's looking for more. That's the quickest way to find a buyer. And the, the good thing about it is you were basing the price for your deal off of what they sold. <laughs> so it's like you're t- the information that you were using to kind of get your numbers together about what was going to work for you was based off of their properties. So if that's the case, why not reach out to them and see if they have somebody that's looking for more? Because that's going to be the easiest, easiest way. Um, another good tip, if you are, you know, say you're calling those agents and you're working those, you're thinking, all right, cool. I don't have any money. I don't really have any, um, a large network. What else can I do? You know, we're in the age of, of social media and, and you're literally have access to anybody in your market who is, has a social presence. So if you want to go to Facebook, if you want to go to Instagram or you know, really Facebook is probably the biggest, the biggest marketplace for it. But you go to a Facebook group, join a free Facebook group of people who are investing in your area. If I'm in New York, I'll go in the, the search page on Facebook, real estate investing New York or wholesale deals, New York. You'll see people posting in those groups every single day. Um, and you could literally Post your deal in there. Post the pictures of your of your house. Say, hey, um, I'm looking for people who are doing deals in the market. I have a deal that I'm trying to sell. Who's interested? I guarantee you before the end of the day, you will at least have one prospective person who's going to want to go and take a look at something. And, and that's easy. It's so, free. And, and this is so easy, guys, because everybody can go on Zillow. Everybody can look for a recently flipped listing and just for people that don't really know what i'm talking about if you browse on zillow you can figure out pretty easily what is a recently remodeled home by a fix and flipper because they usually their finishes are the same they use the same type of ceiling fans blah 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 same colors same finishes and all you have to do and people ask this question like well if it's so easy why doesn't everybody do it think about this the agent is out there showing a home the fix and flipper is out there busy managing the contractors for them to look at every single deal is literally impossible. But if you are the person that provides the value and you go to them and say, hey, what is your criteria? What's your buy box? Let me pay attention to it. And even better yet, you can bring them a deal. It's like, hey, this is how I looked at it. This is what the return criteria is. You already did all the legwork for them. And they can just be like, oh, no, this doesn't work for us because you estimated your rehab expenses too low. Right then and there, you brought them value because you show that you're taking action. But then, two, you you're also learning something because now – you're figuring out how they underwrite their properties. And now you're learning from someone that's very, very seasoned. And don't forget, guys, you guys are creating a win-win-win situation by reaching out to the realtor because guess what? If you find the realtor who's representing the fix and flipper, you are now helping them get a commission in the future. And one of the biggest problems for real estate agents is generating leads. You are helping them create a product for their client who's a flipper, which they in turn are going to help them list it. This is a win-win-win, and this is why it's so good if you just follow Mecca's advice on just looking on Zillow, finding out who the agents are that are representing fixing flippers, and then you might unlock a huge network 
a fixed and flippers that you might not have even known about. Like, this is so amazing. And you broke it down so simple, man. I'm like, like, thank you. Thank Dude, you. Dude, it that. is like, and that's the thing. Like, these are things that I wish I knew when I started out because I'm, I'm, when I first started out, I'm thinking, oh, I got to have a buyer's list of this, this. I got to pay to go get these, but I got to skip trades this. I got to do all this. And the simplest thing is that make a manual list, make an Excel spreadsheet, spend one day calling every agent listing you see in a mile radius. You'll probably find 15, 20 agents, right? You call all those people. Somebody, if your property is priced or well, they're going to have either a person that wants to buy it or they're going to give you the feedback you need to figure out what you need to do to get that deal closed. Maybe they tell you, hey, we buy and sell properties just like this all around the area. You probably need to be a little bit lower than what you have. Or they'll say, you know what, you know, can we go take a look just to kind of confirm because I may have somebody for that. And now what happens is you have a list of 15 to 20 agents that are doing deals in your market that you now can call every single time you have a deal. So it's not even like this is just a one time thing. This is now creating repeat business, which is one of the most important things in Dispo is that how do we bring these buyers back? Right. Just like any other restaurant or somebody who's selling a product. We have McDonald's, we have chicken nuggets. Right. How do we get people to come back and get more chicken nuggets? Or we have this Jordan and we got all these sneakers. Right. How do we get people to come back and start buying all these more, you know, more sneakers? So um, you tap into the people that are doing it the most. And go off the information that you get from them. And so now if you're somebody that is you know, new in the business, you don't have a lot of, you know, startup capital, you're kind of just a one man show. Um, you got your first deal. You, you have a list of agents. You can do that every day of the week and now have a buyer's list of hundred to 200 people, agents that are now going to help you move your deal. Keep in mind, right? These are agents. So you are now tapping in to a network that's probably thousands of people wide at far spans beyond your reach, right? We're talking about so like, all right, I don't have a buyer's list. I don't have, a, you know, 5,000 buyers like all these other guys that are doing deals. Cool. If you have 15 agents that know you, that you call them every week and that you're always asking them and sending them deals about something, you now probably have access to thousands of buyers that you don't even know about. Because what's going to happen is, that one agent that you've talked to and somewhat built a relationship with about what you're doing, you're new, you're letting them know that like, hey, I got these deals, I just need help moving them. They have been doing deals in that area for a while now. So they probably have a buyer's list of 1,000, 5,000 people that they use for their own deals. So now when you send something to them and you say, hey, whatever, you know, we'll partner on the deal, we'll give you a chunk of the change on the back end, you just do your thing. Now that person is sending it out to all of their people and you are now effectively dispoing your deal to thousands for free, really, because it's wow. not, you're not paying for anything. Right. So it's like for free, for free, Come on, guys, for free. Come who, cares? On. who cares if you engage in two grand on the back end? Right. You didn't pay for it anyways. So <laughs> like it's for free. And I think people really need to understand that. You, you don't just reach out to agents either, right? So, Emeka, maybe you have some advice here. How would someone stand out from the thousands of other people who reach out to these realtors, right? Because my advice is always to tell people like, hey, when in doubt, just think one to three steps ahead, meaning put some little extra thought into it, put some effort into it so you can stand out from anybody else. Like one of the ways that I led with value with you first, Emeka and Olu, is like I showed you guys how I underwrote short-term rentals. And I told you exactly this is how I analyze it. But I showed you how deep I go to show that I'm better than most of the other people. So for people reaching out to these agents now, my advice would be learn to underwrite, post some comps, and actually say like, this is why I estimate the rehab cost to be this. This is why I think it's a good deal. What do you think? Show that you put some thought into it versus someone that just says, hey, I got this deal. Can you take a look at it? That's so broad. To me, it's almost annoying. But you need to show that you put some thought into it. So they know that they're working with an above average caliber person. What, what do you think? How did you stand out? So the way I stood out is, is, is very similar, right? So 
um, you, you, you mentioned something that is not only key to working with agents, buyers, or whatever, but key in this business partnership in general, lead with value, right? For anybody that is interested in like investing, whatever, whenever you're looking at working with somebody else, always lead with how you can bring value to whatever they're doing. A lot of people don't have time to hear whatever. So if you're talking to an agent, your value to them is is going to be based off the work and the focus that you put into your own deals, right? Because they know that, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about and whatever he's going to bring to me is going to be something that I want to move on and is worth my time, right? So if you're new, right, it may take some time to get there, right? But if you're at least putting in the effort to have a good quality conversation with an agent and break down where your numbers are coming from, that's going to go a lot farther than just saying, hey, here's something. Let me know what you can do with it. They'll probably never talk to you again after you do that. <laughs> they'll just, they'll, you'll send them messages, give them a call, and then they'll, they'll move on. So you really have to, you know, show that you know what you're talking about. And even if they think that you're a little bit wrong or that your numbers are off, ask them why and then go back and forth in that conversation. So it's a conversation that they actually remember, right? So if I'm talking to somebody, say Kent's in the, uh, the agent here, and I'm telling him, hey, you know, we're selling this property for 150. You know, I wanted to see if you had any buy buyers or people in the area that you're working with that may be interested in the deal. Um, you know, the first thing, if he's a busy agent that's doing deals, the first thing he may say is like, oh, you know what? I do a lot of stuff over here. It probably needs to be around 100K. I don't think we want to move on it. Don't just take that and then like end the conversation, right? Because the whole point in going out and talking to these people is to build relationships, right? We saw, we, we said repeat business. Repeat business means that whenever you talk to these people, there's going to be a ways for you guys to make money or, or do some deals together. So when you take that feedback, right, then Ken says, oh, no, it needs to be 100K. You need to be asking questions about that. All right, you know what? Can you break that down for me? Because from what I'm seeing, I looked at this property, this property, and this property in the area. I know I'm a little bit new, but I'm thinking that going off of this and where the market is going, that my numbers kind of support this. You know, the property itself, we've done our due diligence. We've gone and taken a look at it. We've, you know, seen what type of repairs need to be made. So when I ran my numbers, this is where I came at. Can you kind of break down for me where you're coming from? And maybe I'm missing something, right? And so now what that does is that invites the person to kind of give their expertise and talk about themselves, which a lot of people like to do. <laughs> so if you're talking to a pretty successful agent who's doing a lot of deals, they probably like to talk a lot about themselves, right? Or or show or showcase their ability as to why they're a top agent. So now you're inviting them to share their expertise. And then you can comment on that and say, hey, you know what? I appreciate that feedback. Um, honestly, you know, we underwrite our deals this way. So maybe that's something that I can start um, implementing into our system. If we do that, you know, I'd love the opportunity to follow up on some of these deals to see if we get some better numbers or stuff that you can work with. And so now Kent is saying, oh, OK, this guy's a wholesaler that I don't typically like working with, but he's showing me that he's actually taking the feedback that I'm giving to him and he's going to go and come back with something that's better for me that I can actually move on. And the last part about this, the most important part is you actually got to stand on your word and come back. If you don't come back, just don't call them. <laughs> because if you take the advice that somebody tells you about a property or like, you know, what, what they're giving you about what they what they buy or what works for them, and you don't actually implement that or do it, then the, you coming back to them is not going to do anybody any good because you're just going to show that you don't listen or you don't take heed to what people are, are telling you. And if you want to do a deal with somebody, you want to make sure that they know that you guys are on the same page and that what you're bringing to them is worth their time and their value. And I can't emphasize that enough. It has to be worth their time, guys. If people would think like you need to be like a math whiz or something like that in real estate, it really starts with mindset, your reputation and doing what you said you were going to do and then making sure that you're standing out from the pack so that someone actually wants to work with you. Because guess what? These leading agents in their market like 
game recognizes game. They're true hustlers out there. So they know that if they're working with someone that's below their level, they're not going to spend the time with them because their time is so precious. Everybody has kids. Everybody has family. Everybody has their own problems. You have to stand apart and you got to be able to solve their problem without wasting their time. And I think that's what makes Dispo so simple. It's hard, but it's simple. People, anybody can do it. Um, and, and maybe I'm like, let's bring this, to, let's wrap, bring this in a full circle now to affordable housing because we had Alvin Hope Johnson on on this interview before, and you watched that interview and gave me some feedback. And you know what he's doing right now is solving for you know the middle of America workforce housing with his development stuff. You know, there's still no answer yet for the lower tranche of America, the lower income families that still need a good, safe, clean, dry home and good neighborhoods, low crime. And this is why I really came to you because how do you solve this problem, right? Well, it starts with just one house at a time, one family at a time. And you being in Dispo with the background in affordable housing, know how important it is and what the impact you can make in this world. So let's talk about that, right? How, if we're trying to solve this affordable housing problem, like, and people want to get involved because they might be able to select like, hey, this is a nice home in a good, uh, good neighborhood, low crime, good schools. Maybe I can maybe take a little bit less money, but I will be making a difference in the family's life by selling it to an affordable housing investor like that's one thought i have like what do you think where where can dispo really kind of affect this this mission of affordable housing that we have um i think the the biggest thing is making people aware of how i, I will i'll say it like this i feel like people think that once a deal gets started or you know once you get something on a contract that everything is so set in stone that there's only one way to close a deal, right? Like, oh, it's the person wants a hundred thousand cash. All right, cool. Well, we have to do it this way. There's there's no negotiation room. There's no way to close this any other way. And the biggest thing that we learn in creative financing and um, <clears throat> in just those type of exits alone is that there's a lot of ways to get a deal done, even if the way it starts initially doesn't make the most sense, right? And I think the knowledge of passing that to the people, letting them know like, hey, there's options we can have with this property to make this more affordable for you. And you need to know that because um, too many people, I think they have, they're under this impression that the system is so set in stone and that they have no opportunity to kind of like mm, plead their case yeah. of what would work best numbers wise or how they'd want to move on a deal um, because they don't know the options. They don't know that you can go back you can, you know, somebody that's selling a house may want to do a financing type situation where they take a lower down payment and still finance you a really nice house in a nice neighborhood. Um, and I think what the role Dispo plays in that is that when we get deals that work for affordable housing in these markets, we really have to do our due diligence in letting people know like, hey, like there's several options of how we can get this deal done, right? I want you to open up your mind and think about the important things, whether it is, is this the right pro you know, property in place for you? If it is, we can make something happen, right? Um, and I, I tell that to, you know, the Dispo managers on our team all the time is that even though we're looking for a certain number, if somebody's really, really interested in buying a deal, talk to them about what way they want to do that. Because you never know, we could go back to a seller, renegotiate something, we could structure something on the back end. You know, there's so many different ways to exit a deal that initially they may think that they don't have a chance um, when in reality, they may be the prime candidate for that property. Um, and in the way the market's moving right now, you know, of course, you know, flipping is up and down, material costs are up, you know, there's all these different things that contribute to, you know, how people are modifying their business to be more creative friendly, um, more finance friendly and stuff like that. Letting people know about those options and then also providing them as an alternative to cash options on their deals when they dispo them is gonna be very important. So if you if you got a deal that you know is in a, a good area that will, you know, you can get going with affordable housing, maybe when you dispo those deals, you reach out to people and let them know like, hey, this is for cash is how it is. But if you're interested, we may be able to work out a situation where we can make this more affordable for you and you can actually 
live in a nice area and a nice property. Um, I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. Like they, they think that real estate is so complex that, and so like unfathomable in their mind that like, they just want it simple. Um, and once they kind of understand a little bit more about how we look at real estate and how it's more free flowing and like everything can be changed, nothing is really set in stone. Um, I think it's really going to start opening their eyes to more opportunities. Yeah. And I think people can't underestimate how flexible these transactions can be. Um, a lot of times, even during your regular single family purchases for that everyday homeowner, right? Something comes up in an inspection, you can renegotiate, right? This is literally the same concept. We don't need to overcomplicate it. You might have a lot of deal locked up for cash, but then you might say, hey, look, I got this guy who's doing affordable housing. But obviously, if they, they buy it off the market, it won't cash flow. But if you're willing to take a monthly payment terms on seller finance, maybe then we can actually cash flow and make it sustainable. And Mr. Seller or Ms. Seller, you would also be contributing to providing a good home for a low income family who is doing great things, but people just need a way to kind of get ahead. Just like your family and my family, Emeka, we just need a solid, stable home to kind of grow up in so that we can have a chance, a fighting chance to kind of make it out and thrive, um, especially for the kids in the world. So I, I want to transition this to the next conversation, Emeka. Like, why do you think affordable housing is like so hard to solve for? And if there are like one to two priorities that you think like this generation should focus on, like what should those initiatives be? And how do you think we should track the progress to measure and make sure that we're on track of it? Because I know this is a really big question, but this is part of solving the puzzle, man. I think by bringing people on here and giving their perspective, eventually I think we're going to get enough pieces of the puzzle to solve this. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on this, man. Yeah, man, that's, that, that, that is a big question. It's almost like, once we have that solved with, you know, we may understand how to solve the whole system, right? <laughs> the, the keys to the, the keys to the kingdom. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, it's multi-layer, right? There's lots of parts of that. Um, touching on the last question you asked, the education part about it is, is important because if people don't know they have the opportunities there, then they're not going to know what to do with them or how to act on them. Um, one thing I've always thought about, and this is, it's funny because we kind of talked about this in the first conversation we had is that how do we bridge the knowledge gap for people who are coming up in these in these um, these communities and letting them know that, hey, you can get involved in real estate or understand real estate at such a young age where you can even figure out how to get your own property or you can even do this at some at 18 at right out of high school at, at these ages. Um, I think that's important. I think that you know, um, being able to communicate with the, with people in the communities and, and, and maybe even nonprofit organizations about the value we provide as a real estate firm or a real estate business um, is going to be very key because there's people who are trying to do the work currently right now. Like a lot of there's probably nonprofits, there's probably a lot of organizations that are trying to mitigate things that were put into place systematically. Um but they may not have all the tools in the toolbox to do that. And they may not know that they didn't, that they don't have that. Um, and so if we're really looking at how we're going to take this down for something that has been, you know, systematically been structured for such a long time, it's going to take different people in different sectors working together to try to attack it at one, at one point. And so what I kind of envision is a system where it's like, Hey, us being, investors who do a lot of buy and hold and, and creative type of financing agreements for properties in one market. Say we pick North Carolina, right? How can we partner with, you know, nonprofit organizations or people that organizations that are trying to rebuild these communities and let them know like, Hey, use us as a resource to one, not only, you know, whether it's to hold events to, you know, to teach the community about the options they have in buying these houses or the, the areas that are up and coming that are um, we are active in, that we have deals in, that we can provide. Um, and then also giving that knowledge to those organizations that are doing the work that says, hey, like use us as an asset to get these properties that you the people are going to want. Right. If we're working with people that are trying to rebuild the communities and they know that they have a direct pipeline for people that can negotiate these deals 
in these areas that are nicer communities and, and nicer homes um, for people to live, there's a direct pipeline and say, hey, I know families that are struggling that we can get them into a, a place that they can afford using focused home buyers or using global home buyers, whatever this organization is. And almost using it as a joint effort to kind of teach the community about the options they have to purchase properties and give them the direct pipeline and path forward for that. I'll give you an example. So like when we have deals that we get under contract, whether it's cash or anything else, we'll put them on a marketplace for rent, lease option type things um, on a Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, whatever, where people are looking for those type of homes. Why? Maybe the deal is just a cash deal and it's not meant for that, right? But what's going to happen is you're now showing a property to people who are looking on those marketplaces for those type of deals and you're getting an influx of people calling and asking like, hey, like I saw this listed. Is it available? You let them know, hey, it's not exactly this type of deal, but if you are looking for something, what are you looking for? What is your need and how can we help you find that? Now we have a Rolodex of people that are looking for, you know, who maybe have government vouchers that are looking for, you know, nice places to live where they can move their family to. And we can start mixing, and matching, and matching them up to properties that we have in the contract or some of our other um, investment partners have in the contract and start getting people aware of the options that they have um, just by them responding to a post on Marketplace, even if it's for a deal that was just meant to be a regular cash deal anyways. Right. So we're building that database of people. Um, and now what can happen is you can use that information to go to a nonprofit organization or other organizations in that community that are trying to make a difference and say, hey, we have a Rolodex of all these people that need affordable housing that is good quality and good neighborhoods. We have the tools to negotiate properties to agreements that make sense for them. Right. We need your help getting this word out, implementing this um, with the, you know, the the owners of these communities and all that type of stuff, just like the implementation part of it. Doing that, I think alone will make a lot of headway for people who are who feel like they're stuck, right? Like you'll see a lot of people who are in, in a, situ a housing situation where they're trying to get out of, you know, they're constantly looking on the marketplace. They're, they're constantly looking for, um, you know, people who have good ap apartments for sale or good houses for sale. And they really don't know who to go to. They don't know who to go to or who's going to give them the best deal, who to trust. Pairing with a nonprofit or somebody that's doing work in the community gives you that trust layer, right? Because people are going to recognize, oh, mm -hmm. this is this is a this is a person who really wants to, you know, to help out. And then they're going to see the person who has the real estate acumen. It's like, oh, they're partnering with a real estate firm that's doing deals in this area and actually knows how to get these things under contract and negotiate affordable financing agreements. Cool. Like this conglomerate right here is really what I need. Somebody that knows the community, somebody that's, that's impactful in the community, that's going to actually do the job that they say they're going to do. And then somebody that has the technical background to get an influx of these properties for us so I can take a look and find a new place to live. That's kind of how I see it. You know, I feel like there's a, you know, it can grow from there into a lot of other ways. Um, but I feel like that's one of the ways that you you attack the knowledge gap, you attack the um, the the um, the vague, the gap in actually having an impact in the community, right? Because you can be a real estate firm, and then somebody sees your name, and they may think, oh, he's just another guy that's trying to make money off of me, or that that, that trust factor isn't there, right? And it's not your your number one your number one priority isn't really in your business to, to build that trust factor because you got to focus on other things. So you leave that for the organizations that are doing that, right? And you specialize in doing the contracting and, and acquisition side of it. You guys pair together and see how that can help out. Dude, I love that, that you really focus the solution on like a localized 
solution because that's how you start. You have to start with the local community and you have to start educating folks on one, what is possible within the realm of real estate investing. But then you too, you're establishing credibility with the nonprofits in your local organizations that there's trust. One, you establish that there's a need with just how much influx of volume or requests or increase you have to your postings on Facebook or Craigslist, whatever. But then you also work with the nonprofits to show that, hey, there can be a steady streamline of, of properties that might accomplish your nonprofit mission if it's related to to affordable housing and on top of that then you are able to one help them look for quality tenants right because what what do we know right we hear about the stigma of affordable housing all the time it's drugs um you know gangs drama all that stuff associated with and that's why people don't get into the space and i love that we're talking about awareness and education it's kind of like back then when they talk about drinking and driving it was all over tv commercials right this is part of the process we had to create awareness for this issue or just lack of supply and affordable housing, start sharing with people different ideas and perspectives on actually how to solve it. And then actually just trying it out, trying a local market like that, dude. So man, Emeka, you, I'm so glad you came to this podcast today and shared your wisdom and all the gems. And you made it so simple for everybody. So, so simple for everyone to get started because no matter where you grew up in, Emeka is like a perfect example of like, being a go-getter, having grit, and then just figuring it out and failing forward on every step of the process. And that's how you made it into this piece of the process, becoming the dispo don in your business and actually absolutely crushing it. So Emeka, like, what's next for you, man? And where can people find out a little bit more about you, dude? Oh, man, that's a uh, what's next for me. Um, we're constantly figuring out how we can scale and provide more solutions for more people. That's part of the reason why I'm here today um, working with you, Ken. It's because, you know, you're you're super passionate about this mission. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing for us is, is, is figuring out how we can help more people in scaling our business um, and, you know, be able to get this to a point where, we can, you know, systematically place this in anywhere around the country and still have the same impact. Um, and I just wanted to say one last thing to touch on that last question is like that you asked about what we can do. Imagine being somebody in a community where you're reaching out to the government programs or reaching out to, you know, the housing programs in your area that are you know, supposed to be giving you options. And they say, hey, you know what? We're partnering with this firm that has properties all over this area. Right. Would you like to be able to maybe we can get on a call and, you know, try to match you up with somebody who can get your financial situation and have properties already ready to go that they can match you up to and we can expedite that process. Like how much better would that be than somebody really like, you know, being stressed out, trying to figure out where that next you know, possibility is going to come from. And so um, for me, what's next is just that really, really building out this system that we have already that's already working, um, expanding the team and scaling to a point where we can do deals in any part of the country and help people out to to really get their deals sold. My biggest thing is that I want our team to, you know, be known for having a solution for any type of problem an investor or somebody may have, right? Whether we're going to sell our own deals or help people get their own properties in the area, we want to have be a one-stop shop for everything. So um, next, you know, as far as, you know, how to get there, it's going to be with partnering with more people like you. Um, it's going to be with, you know, looking at our systems and like seeing where um, we can focus on and make sure we're hitting our numbers a little bit more, um, adding on to the team, you know, new, more dispo managers and acquisition managers in, in different areas that can focus on these markets. And as it relates to affordable housing, is that really getting an influx of deals and properties that we can, you know, turn around and, and, and underwrite and get under agreements that work for creative and, you know, that are going to be affordable for people in these, in these areas, and then continuously being able to provide that as a solution for them, or at least an avenue for them to go to, um, to get that going. And I think once we, you know, it's not going to be overnight, it's going to take some time to build to that point. But once you do it a couple of times and then you reach out to those other organizations and they see the work that's been done, they see the progress. I think that's really when things are going to start to flow and start getting connected because they're going to be able to say like, oh, wow, like you guys are really 
are providing a better solution, especially in the market that we're in. How do we scale this? How do we 10x this? How do we work together where you can use my community outlook, my community reach, and the resources that we have to provide an avenue where somebody can get that, you know, can be, that can be more accessible to them. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's really the next thing for me. For anybody that is, you know, wants to get in touch with me, you know, wealth with E is my IG down there. I'm all about building wealth and helping people out and, you know, um, seeing how we can solve some problems together. I'm always available to try to help people sell some deals or, you know, to talk to them about um, how we can get stuff done in the markets, partner up. Um, yeah, I mean, even even just while I'm here working with Kent, that just started from uh, a conversation at a or at a restaurant where we were just sitting down talking about uh, talking about life and affordable housing and the stuff that we're passionate about. So, if anybody out there is you know struggling to get their first deal sold or doesn't really know exactly how to to make that happen, um, hit me up. See see what we can do to help out. Always always available for that. Dude, I love that. This has been an amazing conversation, Mecca, man. So for listeners out there, if you have any deals you need help with or you want to learn how to do dispositions, squad up with Mecca. DM him on IG at Wealth with E, E as in the Echo, and find him, talk to him, learn from someone that's been in the game for a couple of years already with all that experience. You would be a mess if you, if you pass up on this opportunity. So Mecca. Thank you again for coming on to the show. This was an awesome conversation, man. I felt like this was such a, a great heart-to-heart conversation. I loved it, man. I'm I'm so blessed that you came on to the show. And thank you so much, man. Hopefully, we'll get you back on the show when we talk about our next deal that we do for affordable housing. Uh, I'm excited, man. So this is gonna be this is gonna be dope. And I can't wait to have you back on the show. Thank you. Heck yeah, man. I love it. I love it. Let's uh let's change the world one step at a time. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. All right, thank you guys, and we're out. <laughs>